Good afternoon once again. If you've been tuned in to us since 10 a.m., thank you very much for your consistency and your perseverance. Uh, I know we've had a lot of information. We've been doling out some great uh, author discussions, and now it is time for our keynote speaker. So once again, my name is Marquita Gooch Boyd. I am the Assistant Director for Technology and Training here at the Clayton County Library System and I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, Dr. Erica Heilig. Uh, Dr. Heilig is a native of Albany, Georgia, and is the lead author of I Wear a White Coat, From Tribulation to Triumph, The Authentic Truth of the Black Doctor's Journey. She is currently practicing as a registered pharmacist in the pharmaceutical industry. She holds an undergraduate degree in biology from Fort Valley State University, diploma in pharmacy technology from Albany Technical College, and a doctor of pharmacy degree from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, all of which carried graduation with honors. Uh, her career reach extends into many areas of the profession, including, but not limited to, inpatient and community settings, academia, specialty pharmacy, and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Erica's passion resides in narrowing the gap for minorities to enter and attain success in the field of pharmacy by demystifying the process and providing guidance to those seeking that direction. At present, Dr. Heilig resides in the Atlanta area uh, with her incredible daughter, Savannah Grace. And with that, I give you Dr. Erica Heilig. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, welcome to everyone. Um, I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to be able to speak today. Um, and I really hope that there's something that I say that is instrumental to each of you, um, no matter where you are on your journey, um, and that it motivates you to, to move a little bit further and do a little bit more and do things a little bit different than make maybe you have already been doing them or how you've been thinking about them. Um, this will not be your traditional keynote. I will not be speaking to you, uh, be speaking at you. I will be speaking to you. And um, I do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, I don't have very many slides to show because I really just want to provide a platform to give you some background, give you some reference, understand where I am, where I started, and um, and just see it. And, get a snapshot of where I'm going. And hopefully that will open the floor for dialogue to ask any questions. I'm hoping we can utilize the chat feature to be able to kind of capture those questions um, and have a, a, a really good dialogue Q&A section, session here at the end um, as we close out. So let's just jump right in. I'm really excited about it. So today I'm sharing with you from coat to cover. Um, it's my journey to authorpreneurship. And so that is a play off of the title of my book. Um, obviously, just based on my background, the introduction you've heard, um, I do wear a white coat, uh, which is a symbol of not notoriety and um, that is associated with healthcare professional, professionals who have attained a doctorate level um, in their particular practice or specialty. And uh, to cover is actually to a book cover. So I never thought that I would be writing a book, but now you can see how my journey, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you can see how my journey as a healthcare professional has led to um, my journey to entrepreneurship. And that is actually a term that was coined by um, my coach, Jasmine Womack. And um, because I thought that truly this would just be me writing a book, but it does in turn open doors to create um, opportunities for entrepreneurship. So let's dig in and see where we go. All right, so disclaimer. I, uh, the statements and I'm, I'm just gonna shrink you guys here. I'm gonna actually go off screen too. I'm gonna turn my camera off so we can save some bandwidth. Uh, one second. All right, so the statements and opinions expressed in this presentation of, are, are of my own and should not be interpreted to reflect any of those of my employer or any other organization that I'm affiliated. Um, I otherwise have no conflicting um, affiliations other, or other endorsements to disclose. And let's see, we can actually... All right, so overall, we're gonna go through just a high level outline 
um, high level outline of, you know, how did I get here and what makes me qualified to do what I'm doing in turn, especially in terms of um, becoming an author, because I had that question quite a bit. And so I can imagine that some people who are um, early on in their journey, or even if you are established in your journey, you may constantly be asking yourself that same question. What makes me qualified? What makes me um, the authority to be able to do what I'm doing or write about what I'm writing about? Um, we're going to touch on some of the, the companies some of the ways that you find comfort and discomfort and how leveraging your network is really what is going to be the key into um, really just increasing your net worth. And then just looking, segueing over into just the planning, you know, starting, you've already decided you're going to write this book. Okay, how do you start? How do you plan? How do you execute? What should you be thinking about in those stages? And then the elephant in the room, you know, what about the fear factor? How much money is this going to cost me? What about time? How do I know this is going to be, a, there's going to be a guaranteed return on my investment? And then also just setting your expectations so you can kind of get an idea of where you're going and and what you should be expecting on the other side or when you need to reset your expectations. And then also I'll close out with some recommended resources that have been extremely helpful to me. Um, so I would say these are highly recommended resources. And then, like I said, just engaging in some dialogue. So hopefully we can um, capture the questions that are coming in through the chat. So let's get in. So who am I? Um, as alluded to in my background um, in, in the introduction, uh, I'm a small town girl. I'm a native of Southwest Georgia. I'm the, the eldest girl of eight siblings. So I'm a little bit bossy, I'm a little bit headstrong. I am the mommy of one who is now repaying that bossiness and headstrong um, nature back to me. And so Savannah is four years old and she runs the roost. Um, I'm a licensed pharmacist of 10 years, but I've been practicing in the industry for 17 years. So I was actually a technician, a grad, an intern and a graduate intern all while um, before going to pharmacy school and while actually in pharmacy school. And here of late, since my book published in um, August of this year, and so here of late, I have added the uh, the title of author uh, onto the existing titles of coach and mentor. And so I, I asked, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, how do I qualify? And this is one of the questions I ask myself a lot. Like, what makes me qualified to be able to write a book, to be able to talk about the things that are on my heart that I think need to be in a text to, to close, to really address this gap. And so you can see here just kind of a listing of those accomplishments that were introduced in, um, in my background earlier. And so in short, it took my writing coach to bring to my attention that this is how I qualify because I've put in the work and I've done the things that have given me the experience and the exposure and the opportunity to learn more about where the gaps are, where the needs are, and how to fill those gaps with the appropriate needs. So how did I get here? <laughs> oh, so this is being a little vulnerable. Um, I actually got here because so I, I know many of us probably grew up watching the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and in in the theme songs, he says, you know, on the playground is where I spent most of my days. Well, I wasn't that person. I was in the library. That's where I spent most of my days. Um, one second. And so as a result of that, um, I was doing a lot of book reports, a lot of research papers. I grew up reading R.L. Stein and Beverly Cleary and the Babysitter's Club. And my all-time fave, and still is, is Green Eggs and Ham. And there is no way that anyone can convince me that there is any other book that's better than that on the face of this earth. Um, so you can see in this top picture, on the um on the right hand side of the screen this is just me as a as a little girl you know i i grew up reading books i grew up being exposed to the weekly reader and highlights and i remember vividly the pizza hut book it program and so you can see the two women that are in the very top corner of this slide, that's my aunt and my grandmother. And so it is true that the apple, you know, it doesn't fall far from the tree because my aunt, who both of these women are lifetime educators, um, I was actually the one person in my family who just kind of fell a little bit further away <laughs> from the tree. Um, I grew up with my aunt, who was a retired principal, my, my grandmother, who is a retired second grade teacher. Um, I was just planted in a family that was just 
sprinkled with educators. And so I felt almost obligated to have to go into education, but I knew that wasn't me. However, because of their influence, reading and writing and interpretive skills became second nature. Spending that time in the library became second nature. And so I fell in love with words and I fell in love with alliteration and I fell in love with with textbooks and just learning. And so I had to find a way to be able to pull all of those things through, but really do it in a way that set well with me. And so it took some digging, but fast forward 20 years or so, I've realized that I loved all of those things, but I love them in the face of science. And at my grandmother's musing, um, I decided to go to pharmacy school after she, um, she kind of poked the bear a little bit and told me that she wanted me to be a druggist and initially when it when it came up in the conversation I was a little rebellious because I initially went to undergraduate um, pursuing my biology degree thinking that I was going to become a medical doctor and I got there and I realized that I faced a lot of the same fears and a lot of the same challenges that I faced in high school that I hadn't really overcome and I realized that I didn't want to go through another standardized test but on top of that I didn't want to make the time commitment that it was going to be required for me to attain the goal of being an OBGYN, which is the only thing I wanted to do as a medical doctor. And I wasn't one of those people who was willing to make that sacrifice to do something else just to say that I had attained an MD. And so I decided to um, just take my bachelor's degree after I graduated and go home and figure something else out. And so my grandmother is actually the reason that I'm a pharmacist because she pushed me into the directions to start thinking about other opportunities in healthcare. And so you can see on the far left-hand side of the screen, this is really when I just started getting my footing in school and just finding a passion for what I was doing. And then graduation there, obviously in the middle, and then um, later on moving into my first corporate role within pharmaceutical industry. And so that all set the stage for some of the absolute best years of my life. Um, I have th some of the best memories just starting my profession. Um, you can see on the far left hand side, my so um, seated with two guys who I actually went to pharmacy school with, and we all ended up in Washington, D.C. training um, in postgraduate programs at the time. And so this was actually at my graduation program that day. And it was just absolutely amazing to be surrounded by so much love and so much encouragement and support and knowing that I had actually attained another level of success within my profession. But I was still seeking, like, where's my fit? What do I need to be doing? And this is when I started to realize that the gap was narrowing even more because I was noticing that the way that I practice and the way that I was being educated and the experiences that I was having were different from some of my colleagues who didn't look like me. But I wasn't in tune enough to know that I really needed to be nailing down why and paying attention to that. And so I moved on in my career. And you can see the second picture is me on my first day <laughs> as an assistant professor um, at Xavier University College of Pharmacy in New Orleans. And I loved it. I absolutely loved being a teacher. I loved being able to work in the hybrid model, to be at the bedside with patients at Tulane and taking care of adult and pediatric patients. And there was nothing better better than the third picture because now I was a Falcons fan living in New Orleans and we were having an amazing year that year. So you can see that my door um, actually celebrated it unapologetically. And then in the last picture, I loved being able to do those things like I mentioned before, being a coach and being a mentor. This is not my daughter or my sister in this last picture. This is actually a student who became quote unquote my twin and she is still attached to my hip to this day. But being able to mentor and coach and teach is when I realized that there was a greater calling for me to be doing what I needed to be doing and what I needed to be doing. And it wasn't inside the classroom, but I needed a bigger platform. So I ended up leaving Xavier and then... I took a role full time at Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, Indiana. And that's when the tide began to shift. Now, from the outside looking in, you would think, oh, she's made it. You know, she's super successful. She's now in corporate America and everything is going to be great. Well, that was partly the case. It wasn't 100% the case. 
So in the next six years that followed, I was forced to find that comfort and discomfort that I mentioned earlier, because everything I knew that everything I knew, everything that I was comfortable with changed. I was in a different geography. I was in a different area of the U.S. where the culture was completely different. My family ties were pretty much destroyed because all of my family was still in South Georgia or in the Southeast part of the United States. Um, my friendships were, all of my static friendships were far away. And so I was forced to, now in my thirties to build new friendships and build new relationships all on top of learning corporate grooming because I grew up in a clinical space. And so this was so much more different than what I was prepared to do because pharmacy school doesn't teach you these things. And so this, these are just a few things that I was facing and there were more, but then entree mommyhood. And although I was ecstatic to be um, to be expecting and knowing that my daughter was healthy and being able to really fulfill that dream of starting my family, which is why I walked away. One of the reasons I walked away from medical school um, or, or pursuing medical school, I was ecstatic about it. However, postpartum depression trickled in. And so now you have this on top of all of the other um, variables that I was already kind of navigating. And so. I really just continued to do what I what I knew to do because that was the way that I was raised was just kind of, you know, keep my head down and press through it because eventually the tide would shift. However, I was dealing with career ebbs and flows. Um, there were promotions, there were layoffs, there was, like I said, depression. And then I was starting to see more and more of the inequality in the workplace. And I start, and this was not just, you know, racial related, but I was starting to see it um, from marital status perspectives. I was starting to see it from gender status perspectives. I was starting to see it from a perspective of pay. And it, it became more and more frustrating to me because I didn't understand where all of these, um, these challenges were coming from. And so I decided that I needed to start thinking about things a little bit differently, but then I got fired. And I got fired based on a false accusation. And I sat in that for six weeks because it was the first time in my life that I felt like I failed. Even though I knew that the reason I got fired was wrong and I knew that I was fighting the battle to right the wrong, I still realized that this was not the place for me to be. And in order for me to move, I had to be forced to move. And so as a result, I got fired up. But then COVID-19 happened just like it did to everyone else. So now what? This is the place where my book was born. And so I decided at this point, I need to start using my network to increase my net worth because I can no longer rely on my nine to five or my doctorate of pharmacy to be that one mainstay of income or that one mainstay of opportunity or exposure because anything could happen at any time, just like me getting fired. And if I had not been in the position financially or mentally to be able to handle that, only God knows what would have happened. So what did I do? Well, back in 2019, before I lost my job, I saw a Facebook recording for, for um, my current coach, Jasmine Womack. And it was almost like in this recording, she was talking to me about, you know that there's something in you, you know that there's a purpose, you know that there's something that you're supposed to be writing about. People are waiting on you to be able to put words into a book to be able to to influence them and to impact them and to be able to change their lives. So why are you waiting to answer the call for this assignment? And I sat in that for a couple of hours and then I decided to send her an instant message. And when I did, we exchanged a few conversations. I set up an introduction call and within that 30 minutes, she told me, she convinced me, you need to be doing this. And so I set up, I set up a VIP day call with her in December of 2019. And in that VIP day, and this was a four-figure investment, in that VIP day call um, or uh, that VIP day event, this is an eight-hour commitment in which we came in and we laid out the entire format for my book from cover to cover. This was 
devising the title, figuring out what my approach was going to be, how I was going to market it, um, how the chapters were going to be laid out, what the titles were going to be, who was going to write about what, who I would, could potentially ask. Every question that needed to be answered was answered in that day. And so I walked away after that eight hour day with a blueprint for what I needed to do. And so our goal was in, oh, in 90 days, I should have this book done. And we should be able to market, promote, and everything would be great. And so I, I left the meeting. I recruited and confirmed all of the contributors that we had discussed. And then February 2020 came and the world stopped. And when the world stopped, so did my project. And so I sat in that in almost in a form of, of neglect and depression and frustration and anxiety for about two months. And I realized that I still needed to grow. And I did, but it was very slow. So in that time when everyone was just trying to regain their bearings, I began to start focusing on preparation and planning. And so what did I do? I started, I started um, seeking out and attending more classes that would help me to perfect that craft and understanding exactly what people needed to hear, where the gap was and what I was writing about. How could I fill that gap? Others that had done it, how had they done it? How had they approached it? Where do I really niche down and start to answer the questions that are left unanswered? from a different perspective. And that required me investing time. It required me investing effort and energy and resources. And so I started moving in a different way. And I went back to the blueprint that I got from my VIP day and I reached out to um, a cover designer. And so you can see here the very first draft of the cover of my book. And we, I just gave him in an email a high level um, description of what I wanted. I scheduled, and this is what he sent back. This is my very first mock-up. Um, I scheduled photo shoots because I said, you know what, whenever this does finally hit the presses, I need to have all of my prints ready to go for marketing for the book cover. Um, and so you can see here on the top right hand corner just that this is the last shot that was taken as we were wrapping that photo shoot. And I can tell you I was scared to death because I just thought, okay, I'm I was still thinking I'm continuing to spend all of this money for this for this book and not knowing what it was going to do. But I continued to move forward. And so you can see this very bottom picture is when I um, pursued LLC formation because I thought I needed Needed, I knew that I needed to continue to invest and I needed to be committed to the process in order for it to be as fruitful as it needed to be. So how did I do all of that and put it in action? I hired Jasmine as my writing consultant and I continued to work with her and I continued to make those investments, financial and um, emotional, mental and spiritual in order to, um, to yield the results that I needed to yield because I knew she had a proven track record of writing. She had a proven track record of editing, of self-publishing. She was an edge a language arts language arts educator of 12 years. And so it was just undeniable that I knew that I had someone in my corner that could help guide me through the process because not only could she coach me through it, she had seen it and done it herself and was able to replicate it with hundreds of other authors self-published authors at that. And that lead to me making those connections that I talked about, like with my cover designers. I was able to, to locate my editor. I was able to locate my um, audiobook producer. And I was able to talk to other publishers in the industry and understand what that process looked like so I could make the decision on whether or not I wanted to pursue um, traditional publishing versus self-publishing. And then that led to me just having that access to the blueprint for self-publishing because now I had all of these questions answered. I had this draft of, of action uh, and this strategy for my VIP day. All it took at this point was for me to make decisions on what I wanted to do and then figure out how I wanted to put those things in action and what I wanted to delegate. Because I knew that I was working with limited time. Keep in mind, I was still working a nine to five. I was the mother of a young child I wanted to be as present as I possibly could with her. I still wanted to be successful in my career because I needed to make sure that this mainstay was still in place in order for me to continue to grow my business on the back end, because this is what this has turned into now. This is no longer a book. This is now a business. And so I have to be very cognizant of how I am expending my resources um, in, in order to make sure it grows. So I had to learn where my strengths were and then start to delegate where I knew that I did not have the strength, the time or the capacity to do such.
Then I had to learn how to leverage social media platforms and to start promoting my release early and often, talking about it to my friends, talking about it to family, talking about it to my colleagues. And so if you take the time to go back and look at social media, I am not a, a, press, a person who has a large social media influence. It's it's not something that I've always chased after. I've not been the person who liked to be the center of attention. I was always the person who liked to be in the background and be the servant leader and really impact change, but I didn't need to be seen to do that. And so coming into this social media space and starting to grow has been a challenge for me and it continues to be such. However, one of the things that I had to learn to do back on the blue box about delegating, I had to hire a marketing team because I knew that my business needed to grow, but I, I knew that I was not in the place to be able to take that on, to create content, post constantly, make sure that I was engaging my audience and that I was trying to attract followers as well as um, be attractive to followers um, for, my, for my business and for my presence to grow online. And then I continue to invest in growth opportunities. I've been working now with Jasmine for um, since 2019. So we're looking at, you know, a two, three year commitment here and I'm moving forward. I've already locked in for the next year and I continue to elevate the amount of the investment that I um, that I've made because I see how it is yielding the results because I've gone from the baby steps of having just a blueprint to now having a published book to booking speaking engagements to book booking bulk book orders, to being asked to sit on panels, and now looking at, um, I'm getting ready to release my audio book here in the next um, couple, in the next week or so, and then now being asked to create facilitator guides and coaching programs and mentorship programs. And so all of this started from a VIP day and using my network to create more net worth for me. And so again, this just goes back to building, selecting and building those relationships with the chosen vendors that um, you find that are best for you to work with and ask a ton of questions. Even now, I continue to ask a ton of questions. Um, I think there's there is no limit on the amount of questions that you can ask because this is absolutely a space that is foreign to many. And I was coming from healthcare and now into a space not only as an author, but as an entrepreneur. And admittedly, that was not something that I had considered initially. I considered only writing the book and putting it out into the atmosphere, not realizing I was creating a business. So this has been a very steep learning curve for me. And I think that that's probably my largest takeaway that I would share is that this is not just a one-time thing. This is an investment in your time and your effort and your energy that if you do it right and you think about it, it should scale. But the question is, how will you scale? And so you have to plan and execute. You know, what are those resources? Who are coaches? What webinars or trainings or workshops or conferences can you go to to help guide that process? Ask yourself the question, do you want to pursue traditional publishing or is self-publishing the best for you? I chose self-publishing because I didn't want to deal with the middleman. I wanted to make sure that I had the sole rights and um, proprietorship for everything that I did. And when I got ready to make a move, I, was, I wasn't going to have to be bound by um, some type of contract with someone else who held rights to, um, to my, my creative content. I had to understand my why. And this was not, this was a, a project of purpose. This was not a project for profit when I did it. And so it didn't start to make sense to me that it would make dollars and cents until I realized on the back end that this was a business and I had to start respecting it as such. But the, the struggle for me in the beginning was making sure that I stayed true to my why. And my why was that I wrote this book to feel, fulfill a purpose and a gap for those people who are minorities looking to enter into the healthcare space, but are not appropriately aware of what those challenges look like and how to navigate that path. And so everything that I commit to now, make I have to make sure it ties back into the why and that it helps the greater, um, the greater purpose as opposed to just padding my pocket. Um, and then I had to initiate my plan. You know, does that, how does that navigate with the next steps that I have in mind? Does it fit within that path and that pattern? Is it a part of the journey? Is it something that I can scale? And absolutely, this is something that I can scale and I have, I have scaled and will continue to scale. But I think it's also, um, a, this is a seed planet for you to think, okay, when you write this book, is it just you telling your story? 
or is it you telling a story with steps to overcome or steps to attain X, Y, or Z? What is the end goal? What is the reader walking away with? How will they be changed after ingesting your content? And that's what you have to keep top of mind because just telling your story, anyone can tell a story, but where is the impact? And so that's why it's very important to plan your content before you write. And a lot of it just goes way back to the fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade, when we used to brainstorm and we had to write a draft and you had this, you know, standard um, format for creating reports. You know, you had an introductory paragraph and three supporting paragraphs and a conclusion. And those are the types of things I had to take it back to the fundamentals. And I had to really plan that content. So again, this is what you saw in the VIP day. And then I had to remember that I hired an editor. So I had to let my editor be my editor and I be the author. And so I had I often found myself making corrections while I was writing and I was wasting time. I was wasting energy and resources because I was so um, I was so committed to trying to make the the project perfect as I was going along that I was missing the opportunity to just get what needed to be on the pages on the pages and allow him to do the work um, of of actually making it pretty. And then the other thing that I think that I needed to do that I didn't do early on was invite my readers along on the on the journey. And so I needed to leverage social media as much as possible to, to build momentum. And this is something that I admittedly missed out on in the beginning because I didn't as engage as much as I needed to because I was stuck in that fear factor. And I was stuck in that handicap of, I didn't wanna do anything right. I didn't wanna do anything if I didn't think I was doing it right. And I felt like I only needed to do it do it when I was doing it right and doing it right now. And so that means like I'm do when I do it, I'm doing it right now because it's right, because it's perfect. And it didn't need to be that way. So it became a handicap. And so now this moves into, okay, we talked about some of the challenges and just planning and executing. Okay, but what's the elephant in the room? Because everyone already always asks, okay, well, how much is this going to cost me? How much time is this going to take? Well, the initial investment, I've heard some people who have started this process as low as $300. And that's just, you know, they've done their own editing. They've, you know, gone to um, sites such as Fiverr.com or Upwork, and they found someone to create um, their, um, their cover design and do their internal layout on the book for, you know, just cheap prices. However, you, my belief is that you, whatever you pay for is what you get. And I decided that I didn't want to take the low end on this approach because I wanted my reader to ingest a high quality experience. And I wanted, since this was an anthology and I was recruiting other people to be a, be a part of this process, I also wanted them to be proud of the, of the final product. And so my initial investment was well into five figures um, when, I start, when I completed the process. Now I cannot give you a, um, a specific number because I was not one of those people who kind of nickel and dimed it and just kept track of everything because I didn't want to be that in tune with how much I was spending because I didn't want to be deflated by the amount that I was spending and then I'm so focused on that that I don't move forward and so that ties into the next one of in the elephant in the room the fear factor so I had to alleviate anxiety and I had to alleviate the thoughts of any judgment or second guessing of myself or from others and just right and so that's why I chose not to keep keep up with all of the dimes and you know the the nickels dimes and cents that were spent in order in the investment phase to get to this point I just kept trucking along because I knew that's where I needed that's how I needed to focus my energy in order to get the best product and I had to trust myself to express myself and to write freely and to say what needed to be said. So in the 11th hour, I went back and added content that was so vulnerable that it was almost palpable in the book. I went back and I allowed my editor to read some things and I accepted feedback from him that said, this is great, but it's high level and this is not answering the need. And I had to go back and in the 11th hour, redo almost an entire chapter because I was limiting what I thought that I needed to express, not realizing that because I limited that, I was also limiting who was impacted. And I had to change that. 
Do I have to go live? Absolutely, yes, you have to go live because your audience wants to connect with you. Admittedly, this is something I still struggle with because I just don't like to be the center of attention, but it is something that I'm working on and it is something that I realize is an area of growth. And so I continue to be invested in that space and figuring out ways that I can really answer the call and grow my business from that perspective. And then also promoting without the focus on perfection. Again, you just need to put it out there. You need to let people know what you're doing and why and have conversations and reach out and start um, sequestering support from, you know, some of the podcasts that you listen to or, you know, who do you follow on LinkedIn or on Facebook or on Instagram or how are you going to get your project in front of those that really are going to be um, a who are going to solicit to the product that you're putting out and how are they going to help support you? How can you leverage your platform on theirs and vice versa? And then just get out of your own way. And so that, I think that's the very last take on this slide is that you don't, if you don't believe what you're doing and if you don't think that what you are creating has value, how can you expect your reader to do so? And so this requires you setting and sometimes, like I mentioned, resetting your expectations. And that means, yeah, you got to get your mind right. You got to really take the time to focus and figure out, okay, what direction am I moving in and why? And then once you do that, you commit to that process, everything else will manifest. And then the payoff, it comes back. The investment will pay off, but you have to do the work and you have to be focused on the work and you have to have a clear outline and understanding of what your why is and how you're going to accomplish that. And that just means that you have to have clarity. Again, identifying your strengths and being clear on that mission. Where do you fall short? And when you fall short, ask for help recruit that help in the best ways that you know how is that family or friends that you can trust that will help to build your business is that someone who's going to give you objective feedback is that someone that you've had to hire to help fulfill a need such as creating content or posting for you or doing the layout on your book where are you going to get that help where you fall short because let's be honest we work in a society where there's always someone or something pulling on us and there just aren't enough hours in the day for you to learn every talent that there possibly is in order to get this project done. And so you really need to be able to be vulnerable enough to allow yourself to delegate some of those areas where you may not be as strong right now. And then activate. So leveraging all of your resources, don't count anyone out. My very first bulk order came from someone that I went to high school with and we were in the marching band together. She saw one of my posts and I found out that she was the director for a, um, for a program in our hometown. And she ordered a copy of my book. She read my book and then she reached out to me for a bulk order. Leverage all of your resources. Don't count anyone out because you never know where that sale may come from. Price, I priced my book at the top of the price limit um, that's, that I thought was acceptable where I was comfortable. And that was because I realized how much work I was putting into this book. I realized how much work my colleagues were putting into the book. I realized how this book was go going to scale and the impact that it was going to make. And so I priced it accordingly. And I did that and I sat in it and I submitted the price and I made sure that I did not look at it or touch it again because now it was, I had to submit it to, to layout and I had to submit it to cover design. And it was set in stone at that point. There was no way I was changing it. And I knew that I needed to do that in order for me to really continue to be confident in the value that I was putting in between those pages and making it accessible for people to buy. And so in doing that, I had to allow myself to realize that I can't count people's pockets. And if they feel like $24.99 is something that is worth them spending um, their money on to get this product, then I was going to celebrate that. But I also had to realize that people will spend money on shoes, on clothes, on food, on experiences. They will do whatever they want to. So you can't count people's pockets. So when you're setting your price, pick your price and stay with it. Don't question it. And then be prepared for the dry season. Things will take off quickly. You'll sell a lot of books. You'll get a lot of coverage. You'll get a lot of support from your family and your friends and your close circle. And then the slump will hit. But when the slump hits and there aren't as many books going out or there aren't as many calls or emails or text messages or DMs coming in, what are you going to do? And that's where you have to continue to do the work. 
because it really does happen. And so you can see here on the far left is when I got my um, the final copy of the advance for me to to review from my um, from the layout and from the um, from the printing company. And you can see the second picture here is when I picked up the bulk order of the first um, the first round of books that were printed. And then I took it home and opened the box. And I was so excited to actually see my name and my face and my colleagues on this book and this project that was supposed to be 90 days that had now turned into two years almost and it finally materialized and it made every moment and every dollar and cent and every tear and every frustration and every other emotion I had completely worth it. And then I got my very first book review from the advanced copies that we shared. And just to read this was something that absolutely took my breath away. Why? because this was written and submitted by someone who's not even a healthcare professional. And what that let me know was that the audience that we intended to reach was actually much broader than what we actually wrote for. And that's how we knew that we were moving in the right direction and making the impact that we had needed to make. And so I close this out by saying that there are tons and tons and tons of recommended guides and resources and, um, and, and, coaches and consultants and webinars and all types of things that you can access but I stand by tried and true and what I've had my experience with. And so if you're looking for just a quick and dirty, um, but trusted resource to kind of get you on your way or to just to answer some of the questions or demystify some of the processes, then I do highly suggest um, the book Published and Paid, How to Write, Self-Publish and Launch Your Nonfiction Book in 90 Days or Less by Jasmine Womack. And this is just um, a screenshot from her, um, from her website, which is www jasminewomack.com. It is also available on Amazon. And then also just encouraging you to look for other resources because this might not be a fit for you, but there may be others. So encouraging you to just really take the time to go out and um, just invest the time to figure out, you know, what is a good fit for you? Who can help? What type of help do you need? Um, if you're in the slump with cover art or design, I highly recommend Justin Harden at Damascus Media. He's been an amazing person to work with. And then my editor as well, um, Dr. Joel, Joel Bo Boyce um, at JCB Ed Pro. Um, both of these can be found on Instagram. Um, they're both they have both been amazing individuals and please um, let them know if you do, if they, if you are looking for these types of services and you do reach out to them and you find that um, they're a good fit, please let them know that I sent them your way, that I sent you that, that I sent you their way. I'm sorry. And so finally, just to close things out, please connect with me. I hope I've said something today that has been beneficial, that has been insightful, that's been impactful. Um, you can see here um, many ways that you can connect, that you can reach out. Um, the book is available on Amazon. Please like, share, post. If you do purchase, please write a review. Um, the audiobook release is actually slated to, um, to be released in this next week. So very excited about that. That's been a, a, a completely different journey that I did not go into detail today on today. But please follow us on Instagram for all of the updates and details that are coming soon. Um, um, and then also you know, visit our website. You can order the book there, lapel pins, and then other items of merchandise um, that you can consider for purchase as well. So I'm hoping that there are questions or comments in the chat. And, and so let's, let's dig in. Let's see if I can answer some questions that may have come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's quite a bit of um, comments. Um, someone loved the authorpreneurship uh, phrase. So they said that that was cool. Um, one question uh, says, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, how did you solicit the other authors to be a part of your book? Oh, that's a really good question. So I solicited these people. Um, it's my network. My network is my network. Um, so these are all people that I knew personally with the exception of one. Um, so one of them was actually my student at Xavier. Um, which is Dr. Chandler Sheck Snyder. Uh, one of them was actually uh, a year ahead of me in pharmacy school. One was two years ahead of me in pharmacy school. One of the, uh, one of the young ladies, Dr. Um, Brittany James, was actually a young lady that I met at a conference when I was teaching at Xavier. And then Dr. Jamika Holman Cooper, we served on a panel together at Fort Valley State. And that's how I met her. And then her husband, Dr. Rod Cooper, 
it came onto the project because I needed a dentist. And <laughs> he happened to be in the car with her when we were having the introductory call. And that's how he got um, looped into the project. And then our chiropractor, Dr. Cher Gerald Kilpatrick, we actually met at pharmacy school. And then he did not finish pharmacy school, but became a chiropractor instead. And I remembered him and I reached out and the rest is history. <laughs> Nice, nice. Uh, the next question, um, I think you kind of answered it, but they asked, how did you come up with the price point for your book? So again, that was in my conversations with Jasmine and I, cause I asked that question, like, what is that, you know, what does that look like? How do I even know how to price the book? And she explained to me clearly that in most cases when you're doing, so like eBooks and, um, and audio books, typically they are start, start anywhere from like $4.99. And if you're looking at an eBook, it goes up to like $9.99. And then with the audio books, it can start as low as, low as $4.99, go up to $19.99. And then with paperbacks, depending on how you print, the color of the paper, how many pages you have, all of these factors, um, you can go up to around $24.99 or higher. I didn't want to go any higher than $24.99. So for me, my price point was it was either start at $19.99 and scale or start at $24.99. And so I decided to start at $24.99. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Did you experience any writer's block? all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, I, I, and I'm glad that question came up because um, I actually wrote the majority of my book on my iPhone at two o'clock in the morning, laying in the bed in my wow. notes. Yeah. Because that's when I would lay down to go to sleep. And that's when things would start coming to me. Mm -hmm. And I would just pick up my phone off the nightstand and I was like, oh, I'm just going to jot these notes down. And then the notes would become full chapters. And all I would have to do was just copy and paste it, put it in Google Drive, well, Google Docs. And my editor was able to access it. And that's how the book was built. Nice. Um, this next one says why did you decide to make it a book of essays instead of writing just from your perspective? Um, so, so I will say it's not, it's not necessarily just essays. It's everyone sharing their, um, their particular journey. And so they write from their perspectives, but not just about one particular piece or one particular topic. I will say that. So it's not quite in the essay category. Um, and I decided to do an anthology because I knew that the world and the experience was bigger than just mine. It wasn't just a bubble. And I knew that the audience that we were attracting was going to be a diverse audience. They were going to be different genders. They were going to be in different facets of healthcare. They were going to be different ages. They were going to have varying interests, varying backgrounds. And so I wanted there to be someone who could, someone that they could read about and relate to at every part of the book. And I wanted the book to be written in such a way that it could either be read cover to cover or a la carte. And if you wanted to come and you just wanted to read chapter one, and let's say you got busy and you decided to come back three months later and read chapters two and three, you could, and it would still make sense. So that's why I chose to do that approach. I just wanted to make sure that my audience could relate no matter where they were. Cool. cool. Um, someone was asking if you could go back to uh, the slide that had Jasmine's information. Sure. Let me see. What's up there? And then her website is www.thejasminewomack.com. Okay. And I will drop that in our chat. And that's also her IG handle as well, at thejasminewomack. Got it. Um, and let her know, if you reach out to her, let her know that um, where you heard her name. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because that's important, right? Like, you don't want a bunch of just random, Absolutely. like, hey. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're going to reach out, please be serious. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. <laughs> um, someone else asked, so if you could not afford um, the services like Ms. Womack offers, um, how would you suggest they still go about getting their book published or, yeah, that whole thing? So you can absolutely do it on your own um, because there, so I will tell you that 
Jasmine posts content all the time on Instagram that's free. There are YouTube videos that are free. And then if you go and you look at her YouTube, uh, look at her um, Instagram, you can see other people that follow her that also do coaching. So I know, um, and it, it may not be because in all transparency, Jasmine's prices as she's gotten more and more popular because she has been featured in Forbes a couple of times, Voyage ATL, all types of things. And so she's gained a lot of traction a lot of um, success in the last three years and her business has really grown but I know there's another coach um, Naila Harvey N-A-I-L-A-H Harvey who is a student of Jasmine as well who also coaches and so her price point might be a little bit more um, along the lines of what someone may be looking for and may be more affordable I don't know because I haven't um, looked at her pricing structure. However, I do know that she is in the same program with me and has kind of come through the ranks with me with Jasmine. And so she has the same school of thought in so many words. Um, but outside of that, if you can't afford or if that's not in the budget to use a coach, you can absolutely piecemeal this. You can absolutely find the resources to be able to get this done. Um, and those things can be available just by looking at, just starting at the top, starting with someone like Jasmine or Naila and looking at how they're connected, looking at what types of things they're recommending, signing up for their free webinars and resources because they give them out all the time. And then in that, in the meantime, you can be saving your money to make the investments and start small. I did. I started small. I started with one that VIP day. While it may not seem small, it was a $2,500 investment for the eight hour day. But that $2,500 has now turned into a whole book. And when I released my book, my book had not been, I made 5k back in the first two weeks. And with the one bulk order, bulk order, I made over and above what I had spent on everything mm -hmm. to get the book. So it comes back. You just have to save your money and make the investment where you can. Okay. Um, is your book right now just in print format or are there plans to do like um, ebook versions and an audio book maybe? So there, it is in print format now. Um, ebook was just converted two days ago. <laughs> so <Wow>. it will <laughs> go live. Yes, it will go live here in the next week as well as the audiobook. Okay. The audiobook was a little bit of a delay. Um, I was working with a vendor who I think is amazing. However, he had a lot of kind of hiccups that came in along the way because COVID has happened to everyone. And so it put a lot of delays on my project. And so now we're finally at the place where we can push go. So I'm pretty excited about that. Cool. And is each contributing author reading their own submission or is it kind of voice actors? No, it's one voice actor. And I chose to do that simply because it was already a headache <laughs> to, to just get all of the submissions in and to get them all edited and get everything turned back around in a timely fashion. Some people are just much more punctual than others and life happens to everyone. And so it was just, although I wanted everyone to read their own chapters, it was just going to be too much of a headache to try to get it done. And so what we've opted to do instead of that is when we host, when I'm asked to come speak, I offer to have people from the people from the book, other contributors to come and we serve as a panel group. And then we do a read during that panel. And so that's kind of helped to kind of scratch that itch a little bit, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that you do a couple of um, Instagram lives with some of the contributing um, authors as well. Yeah. Yep, we've done that. Uh, we put it on pause the last couple of weeks um, because, again, life has happened to everyone. And so we're hoping to have um, the next one when we come back um, that we're getting scheduled now will actually be everyone. And because we never did a formal book launch because right. of COVID. <laughs> because right. COVID. So when we thought we were going to be able to launch, it was like, no, um, Delta variant is going to come now. And so it just, it didn't work out that way. And so now we're just going to do a large virtual event to allow people to come in and just kind of, you know, connect with them as much as possible via a computer screen. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so that is it for the bulk of our questions. Um, I don't, I think you have a slide that has your contact information too, if you want to yeah. jump back to that so they can see. Sure. Um, yeah. So definitely, you know, follow her on IG. Um, 
go to the website. We drop that link in the chat as well. We also put um, Ms. Womack's link in the, the chat box as well and everything. Um, so yeah, so on behalf of the director here at the Clayton County Library System, I wanna thank you so much for being our, um, our first virtual keynote uh, <laughs> speaker. I hope I did a good job. It, you know, it was fantastic. I was like, oh, maybe I should write a book now. No. <laughs> you should. You should. Everyone should write a book. Everyone should has a book. book. Everyone, Everyone has should a have book. a book. <laughs> yes. And if you have, if anyone has any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Even if you have questions about just working with Jasmine or any other vendors, or if you're just having problems with writer's block or whatever, if you just, if there's something I didn't touch on, you need me to dig in a little bit deeper. I do not mind sharing. So please don't hesitate. Sounds good. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank I'm going to let you go and get back to it. I'm sure you're super busy. <laughs> <laughs> But thank I don't you know again. If that's a blessing or a curse. I, well, <laughs> either way. Either way. Um, so All right. That, thank you so much. You guys have welcome. a great one. You do the same. Thank you so Take much. Take care.